Okay. Um, so we are, I'm opening the session on uh, the privatization of health. My name is Rami Adut. I'm working here at the Hazan Institute, at the Hazan Center in the Van Leer Institute. Uh, I'm the coordinator of uh, policy change, but I happen to have some, some contact with health issues. That's why maybe I'm here. Um, what I would like to do, I will present the lecturers, Professor David Trinitz and Professor Danny Filkin, in, in a minute. First, I would like to raise maybe one, one concern. It's not exactly a question that I, I'm delivering to the lecturers. They will, they will each present it the way they want to frame things. And just um, somehow, I just want to, to, to place maybe one major concern that I have with the privatization of the health um, system in Israel. Um, well, first let me say that um, I think as a major introduction, one, one, basic things, one basic thing has to be said, and it is that since 95 in Israel, we have a legislation, a, a law, that um, put, things in, put things in order. There were, of course, insurance before, but the main, um, let's say, guidelines of the public insurance are being enacted since that law, 95. Interesting enough, it was in, in the height of privatization processes, but it is not a privatization law. Um, well, it, it put, as I said, put things in order. I mean, a basic tax uh, and an income, a, a health tax um, combined with an income tax, that is direct taxes that are um, being uh, paid by each and every resident and um, are given, of course, to, I mean, um, are being delivered to the, to the um, uh, health uh, insurance, which is, I think, maybe, maybe this is not a questionable issue, is a very, very generous basket, very wide basket that Israelis are receiving. And uh, as I said, they are paying for it. They are paying quite, quite a lot. Maybe 5% plus 5%, I would say that's a general estimate because some of it comes from income tax. I don't know, maybe roughly speaking 10% of the income. That's a lot of uh, money to pay. To pay. And, um, and the main uh, basket of service, the, the, the main services are being delivered by HMOs, which are non-governmental, not-for-profit organizations. These are the basic lines in Israel. Now. Come to think of it, sometimes, sometimes, maybe, sometimes I'm asking myself the, the question, okay, so, so what's the problem? Why are we facing all kinds of privatization processes? And mainly I want to raise the main uh, privatization is the way I look at it, which is the commercialization of these NGOs, these HMOs. These HMOs, as I said, they are delivering the main uh, services, basket of services, the public basket of services, but by and by they are also owning, the major ones also own nets or um, private hospitals. When I say private, I mean that in this hospital people are paying out of the pocket money to get services, okay? These same NG HMOs, plus they sell uh, an insurance which is a mixture of public and private insurance. And here, and here is the real question. How come we are facing a situation where about 80% of the population in Israel decided to uh, buy this insurance? And I'm placing the question, this is, we can, we can deal and probably the lecturers will talk about policy issues, but my concern is the public. Why do the public vote for that? How come they do it? What are, the, what are their intentions? What, what, what uh, motivates the public to somehow so-called vote for that? I mean, this issue was never raised as a major issue in elections, but people are voting for that themselves, even though they are paying so much money for the public insurance. Um, is it because all kinds of pressure being put on the public system for example, Israel has like almost 100% occupancy in hospitals, meaning what we call in Israel the expression, the old woman in the corridor. That is, 
and most of the year many people are being attended, being hospitalized, and they don't have a regular bed in a room. They are being put in the corridor. It, it became a symbol, what I'm saying now. So is it that? Is it the lines? Is it the, 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 the fact that maybe it is other general processes of commercializations which are not related to health? Maybe it is the other way around. Maybe it is a marketing issue. Maybe it's not the public. It's the way the, the, the marketing has been successful. So my, not, not exactly a question. That's not a question that I'm, I'm just raising this concern. Because what I want to say, and this will, this will be my last uh, two sentences, is that when we talk about privatization, we tend to talk about the delivery, the organization. Sometimes we talk about financing. But not always we tend to talk about the general public and its, I don't know, daily, daily concerns, its daily behavior. And in this respect, in Israel, what we see is a success of commercialization, privatization, when it comes to daily behavior by the general public. Here I will end. Let me just um, say a few things about the lecturers. First about Professor Chinitz. Um, you have a lot, so I'm, I'm, I'm picking the highlights, okay? I would skip the whole thing. Oh, well, you don't have a choice. <laughs> um, Choice, that was one of the options. Why do people buy what I call, ah, by the way, I didn't say that the name is supplementary insurance. Why supplementary and not commercial? Because it is being sold by the same NGOs, the same HMOs that are delivering the public services. They are also the ones who are delivering or are um, uh, selling this insurance. It's not exactly commercial, it's public-private mixture. Uh, Professor Chinitz, um, holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He moved to Israel in, in 1981. Um, he served as the head of the Social Science Division of the Ministry of Science and um, staff person of the State Judicial Committee of Inquiry. Which inquiry? Which inquiry? Yeah, you know, they had their names. The health system, what do you mean? No, in Israel they put Netanyahu Commission. Netanyahu Commission sorry, Netanyahu Commission is the same, um, the most important commission which, according to its recommendation, this law that I was referring was enacted. So, one of the founding fathers. Um, senior, uh, senior researcher, sorry? It's not the Prime Minister Netanyahu, it's a, it's, a, it's a former judge. But he was the health minister until recently. <laughs> His aunt, yes, it's true. Uh, another Netanyahu, a good, uh, no, I'm not allowed to say that. Another Netanyahu. Um, <laughs> Professor Chinitz also is, um, is at the School of Public Health and he served as consultant. That, that, that is very important of the World Health Organization and the European Health, Health Management Association and uh, president of the International Society for Priority Setting in Healthcare. Uh, Professor Filk um, is, um, is both a, a doctor, I mean a, a physician, and, uh, and um, a researcher into health policy. He is now, presently, he is at the Ben Gurion University and he's an um, um, associate professor at the Department of Politics and Government. Um, he wrote several, I'm not mentioning the books. And he's uh, also a um, co-chair of Physicians for Human Rights in Israel, which means, which means that uh, Professor Filk also somehow crossed the, the fields from the academy to the activist or the, or the, or the civil society. Uh, especially in issues that are related to uh, rights to health, the right to health in the occupied territories, the right to health of migrants and um, refugees, and, uh, and the right to health of the general public. I will mention only one uh, very important struggle which maybe the lecturers will talk about, and this was a big issue in Israel uh, concerning the, um, the, the choice of a physician inside the public hospital. Whether it will be allowed or not, this is a, a question or an issue that is being uh, accompanied. That's just between me and the Turks. Um, 
but I do want to say that I think it's very moving and very incredible that while both of our groups are mourning uh, and feeling sadness uh, for similar reasons that we can gather together and discuss health and uh, it's a great privilege so thank you thank you for for coming um, so what I want to do is I want to uh, think a little bit about the public-private mix before I go into the Israeli case. And then I'll talk about the public-private mix in Israel. And I'll give my views on impacts of the shifting public-private mix on health access and equity. And uh, I'm going to talk about some options for the way forward. And I am going to relate a little bit to some comparisons some thoughts about Turkey, but I've already, from what I've heard this morning, realized that even after doing my homework and reading two recently published articles, and there was one just last week in the New England Journal of Medicine about that um, either I got it wrong or I didn't understand the article or there's a pretty big d d disagreement between uh, some of the people here and the author of that article. So uh, first of all, um, and I'm not going to read the, the slides totally. I hope you can read while I'm talking. But, you know, we tend to get in, because there's an ideological component, there's an inclination to dichotomize everything. And um, I think we have to try to instill, instill in ourselves the ability to look at the fine gradations and details. Um, Secondly, um, if we accept that we live in an age of austerity, and it could be that that's just a marketing tool uh, that has been used by certain people. However, Richard Saltman, who is a close colleague of mine um, and a frequent visitor to Israel, and who for the first 20 years that I knew him was adamant that financing of health systems should be largely public and that health reforms should not tamper with the basic sources of the budgets that would pay for public health care. He has now reached the point where in 2013 he wrote, um, future policy options will have to focus not only on reorganizing existing public health systems, but perhaps shifting some health-related activity out of direct political and financial, but not regulatory control by the public sector. And as an example of that, and directly to the questions you raise about supplemental insurance, I have it underlined, and this could include expanded forms of complementary and supplementary insurances. It's already come up this morning, but I think that very often there is some confusion. If we introduce market mechanisms, are we privatizing? And it should be put on the table that you can privatize without competition and much of the malaise and bad outcomes of privatization that Professor Gal Nord described this morning have to do with privatizing but not competition. And you can do competition without privatizing. Um, secondly, privatization, private is a status. Privatization is a process. So if you're going to make claims about is there privatization or not privatization, you have to say from what point in the history of whatever system it is you're investigating. Thirdly, and here this is my opinion, many people would like there to be what we call a Chinese wall that separates public and private in health care. Um, I'm not sure that that's, clearly you'll see that I'm not sure that's desirable, but I'll make a further claim, I'm not sure it's possible. And given that it's not possible, the question is how do we cope with the porous wall between them? Uh, in the best way. 
but one could make a case that no, we're going to, we're going to totally separate. Um, and so that's my next point. The best way is the the issue is what's the best way to manage the mix. And let's keep in mind that, uh, and this was Professor Garnier is talking about contracting out, um, and he kept saying maintaining responsibility. But the government maintains responsibility for the purposes of my talk. That means the government continues to finance, but someone else is provided. Okay, and clearly that raises all kinds of difficult, potentially difficult regulatory issues, issues but I want to make it clear that we have to keep that, those two dimensions clear in our mind. Are we privatizing finance? Are we privatizing delivery? Or are we privatizing both? And does one implicate the other? Okay, this is the part that uh, Rami already presented, so I'll do it pretty quickly. Um, in not, but, uh, but, but what I will emphasize is that in 1995, and here's the starting point, we basically nationalized our curative medical system. We nationalized four sick funds. Rami called them HMOs. I'll continue to call them sick funds. Um, and those sick funds are required to um, provide a standard basket of services, which, as Rami said, is considered by uh, world standards quite uh, extensive. However, for historical reasons, the government continues to be the main provider of mental health care and long-term care and uh, dental care, which the government was not a main provider of, the private sector was. These three major areas were left out of this standard basket. So they were never nationalized. And the importance of that will come back later. Um, citizens pay an income-based tax to fund the system. Um, and if the amount that the citizens pay is insufficient, and it is more than 50% insufficient, to cover the cost of the standard basket, and Israel, as far as I know, is the only country in the world to have established a mechanism to define the cost of what's being covered. So talk about accountability. Um, that is a kind of accountability that, as far as I know, no other country has taken. And the gap between that cost and the revenues from the taxes we pay will be filled by government general revenues, which means it comes at the expense of education, uh, welfare, defense, everything else. Um, in 1997, uh, the sick funds uh, receive the money from the government on, based on need. We have a capitation formula, which is per person adjusted for age, sex, and geographical area. How much is it anticipated that providing the services in the basket will cost? Um, and the citizens are free to choose one of four uh, funds once a year, six times a year. Okay, so there's, we're, we're trying to put a market in here. Someone wants to tell me there's privatization in that. We can argue about it afterwards. Um, in 1997, another source of earmarked tax money, which was a tax that employers paid earmarked for health care, was eliminated, and the government had to undertake to take the place of that tax. So some people say, well, that's money that was lost to the health system. That's, pri that's um, uh, privatization, although I can't see how it's privatization, because a private source of pay is being replaced by a public source of pay. But of course, many people said that was earmarked money. So there was no question about it. Now uh, the, the government will decide how much the government will be part of the decision, how much the standard basket will cost. And therefore, what the government was trying to do is get more control over the financing of the health system in order to reduce it. That's an argument. In 1998, the, all of the health plans uh, before the law was initiated and according to the law, we're allowed to sell supplemental insurance for services not included 
in the basic basket. Okay, so this can be anything from choice of physician to nice to have services like spa treatment. Um, the uh, government imposed rules on this insurance that the premiums would be community rated. That means flat by age group. And there is complete open enrollment. Any member of the sick fund can join the supplemental uh, plan of that sick fund. And in 1998, also, the government, through an interesting story, uh, ended up uh, more or less committing itself. It's not in the law, but it is. Uh, historically become true to adding an increment of about 1.5 percent to the budget of the basket to, uh, to enable the adoption of new technologies into the health basket. But many people say that's not enough. You also have to account for the growth of the population and the aging of the population in, and the cost of, of inflation of medical services. And so with those things not being accounted for, there's a constant gap between the real cost of the basket and the cost of the basket as defined in the law. OK, what kind, and I think uh, I saw Donnie's title, and I don't know if I'm covering uh, the, the, the types that you're talking about here, but uh, we have these types of uh, um, private payments. We have payments out of pocket, that means with that, like buying tomatoes that you don't buy with insurance, you buy medical care without insurance. Some of that is co-payments that we pay, for instance, when we, uh, ha when we fill our prescriptions. Our sick fund pays most of it, but we pay um, 10 or 15 percent of the cost of the drug. Um, we have private commercial insurance, which is relatively expensive. Uh, and it is risk rated. In other words, the private insurance doesn't have to accept you. Um, but if it's purchased collectively by, and people talked about Eleanor Ostrom type arrangements, um, so we have those in the health sector. Uh, workers' unions. I have the opportunity to purchase relatively low cost private health insurance as part of the university uh, professors' union. Uh, I don't do it, by the way. Um, and we have these highly regulated supplemental insurance programs provided by the sick funds. As I said, they're guaranteed issue and community rated. And because they have such a large risk pool, our smallest health plan has a million members. The premium are relatively low. It's a matter of a few, you know, it can be a uh, hundred uh, shekels a month up to say 400 shekels depending how many people in your family are covered and what uh, and and what programs you buy for that okay i'm sorry that uh, i left pre preparation of the talk to the last minute and i was doing it yesterday and my scanner broke so i photographed so some slides and uh, emailed them to myself and put them in um, but what you're seeing here in this slide is expenditure on health by type of financing and what you see is uh, the dark area here in the OECD average, that's totally uh, government revenue. Then you have some kind of social insurance. Then you have out-of-pocket, and then you have private insurance. So you see that in the OECD average, you have about close to 80% is usually either government revenue, government revenue plus social insurance, then 28% out-of-pocket, and then there are insurance arrangements. Turkey is right next to the OECD average column. And you can see that it's about 20%, 27% uh, government revenue. You have 48%, which I assume is the green card program in the health transformation program. And then you have uh, about 20%, which is um, uh, uh, out of pocket. And then you have a small amount that is insurance in Israel. Uh, which is here, we see that it's about 17% general revenue, 45% uh, uh, so social insurance. Um, we have about 29% uh, uh, out of pocket, and we have about 10% of uh, insurance covered. Um, in this slide, what we show is the amount spent <laughs> privately per capita in purchasing power parity numbers 
uh, the green line that's more flat, that's more straight is the OECD average, and Israel is the blue line. And what we see is that in terms of private out-of-pocket share, we're fairly close to the European average, although in the last period we seem to be uh, going over it. Um, in this slide, what we see is um, uh, the public share of expenditure uh, in, in health care. And uh, this is Israel. Turkey's not in the left-hand slide. And we see that the public share, both for medical services and goods, uh, is lower than the OECD average. But interestingly enough, when you talk about what has happened to out-of-pocket payments in the last decade, we see that out-of-pocket payments has gone down by minus 2.4% in Israel and by minus, I can't read my own number, but it's, it's like by minus 10, 10%, 10 in, in Turkey. So we have to talk about what's going on there. Um, out-of-pocket care as a percentage uh, or private out-of-pocket medical spending as a share of household expenditure, we see that in Israel it's 3.2% of um, household expenditure, and in Turkey it's about 1.5. Um, and here are three important slides that I hope we will discuss later. When we talk about long-term care public expenditure as a share of GDP, we see that while in general public expenditure in Israel is at least 60 percent, it's less then uh, it's less than 1% uh, of GDP for long-term care. The amount spent by government on medical care that's not long-term care would be a much higher percentage. This is dental care. Israel has the second highest amount of out-of-pocket pay for dental care in the OECD. It's almost 90%. And in mental health care, 67 percent. We now have a mental health reform that will, that will include mental health in the basket of the sick funds, so this number may change, uh, or it may not, because people may continue to purchase private mental services. Um, in this slide, what we see is the development over time of the household expenditure on health, and what we see has grown the most is supplemental and private insurance from 5.2% to 29%. But at the same time, things like dental care have gone down. Drugs has remained about the same. And other, which could be second opinions, it could be uh, alternative medicine, it could be all kinds of things. It could also include long-term care uh, and mental health services has gone down a bit which means there may be some substitution, especially in dental care, between the increase in the private insurance, which is considered privatization, and the reduction of out-of-pocket pay for dental care. Here we see the development of the supplemental market and the private insurance market. And uh, what we see is that over time, and especially since 1999, there's been a gradual increase till uh, in 2011, 73 percent of the Israelis' uh, population had supplemental sick fund insurance. And the private insurance was pretty flat from 2003 till 2009 while the supplemental insurance went up. But it, apparently in 2009, the collective purchasing started, and that's why there's an increase. Okay, So you might ask. Why do people purchase supplemental insurance? Why do people who have supplemental insurance also purchase private insurance? OK, now what is the impact uh, on, uh, of these private pay on access and uh, other aspects? So survey after survey shows that about 15% of the Israeli population, it's a little bit higher in poorer populations um, and in chronic care populations defer care because of the co-payments. There are some caps and exemptions on the co-payments, but apparently they're not helping enough. Um, the supplemental insurance enables choice of physician, 
uh, and that leads to public physicians working in private settings because uh, when people can't get care, they can't choose the physician they want in the public hospital or they can't get care quickly enough, then they use their supplemental insurance to purchase care in private settings. And it's pretty, I think it's not ar argued that when you choose the physician, that may also be correlated with shortening the amount of time you wait for care. Private insurance in Israel is completely poorly regulated, and the word regulation has hardly been mentioned today. And I think you can't talk about privatization without talking about regulation, checks and balances. Um, and the private insurance also imposes clear externalities on public and supplemental coverage. The impact on health, access, and equity is, I would say, it's unclear. Um, sorry for the bad slide, but basically what you see in this slide, just for cataract surgery, and I'm sorry I don't have other examples, Israel's waiting times on average, median, and for over three months are not terrible uh, in, in comparison to other OECD countries, and Norway is included in the middle panel in terms of uh, the median uh, waiting uh, over uh, a certain amount of time. Um, in Jerusalem, for reasons that I don't have time to go into, the nonprofit public hospitals that do not belong to the government, they're Eleanor Ostrom type organizations, I guess, um, they're allowed to uh, have private service in their public hospitals. And so uh, some researchers from the Hadassah itself, um, and it's a credit to Hadassah that they allowed them to do the research, um, they did a phone exercise where students called up and asked for appointments. And what you can see here is in Tel Aviv, there is no private practice in the public hospitals. So you can see that for urology, to get an appointment would be 27 days. The private in uh, Shari Tzedek, which is one of the two Jerusalem hospitals, is three days. Uh, the public is 14. Uh, and in Hadassah, the private is two and the public is 85. Okay, but if you go through this list, you see some interesting patterns. So you see, for instance, that in nephrology, it's 132 days public in Shari Tzedek and it's only 29 days. So, you know, we make these big statements but we have, you know, that's an example where we have to break it down and look into the details and ask why, what's causing these waiting times. But in general, what you see is that Hadassah's gap between the private and the public is greater than the public in Tel Aviv, and it's also greater than Shari Tzedek's comparative waiting times between private and public. And this is the Hadassah chart. It's about uh, 20 times. If you have private insurance, you get 20 times faster on average. But keep in mind, this is just a telephone survey of students. They didn't really want an appointment. We can't assume that this generalizes to what happens when an actual regular citizen calls up to actually make an appointment. Why? Why? Because, because people because people don't, ex if, you're, if you're doing research that's intended to demonstrate the gap, if the students aren't instructed to push, but they just take the answer on its face, and we all know in Israel, nobody takes the answer on its face, okay? So, so well, there's a whole part of this, there's a whole part of this research on the GP's impressions of it. I have critiques of that as well because this is just their impressions. There is, there is clearly an impression from this research that if you have supplemental or private insurance and you can go privately, or if you go privately, the research didn't ask how you're gonna pay for it. And since over 60% of Jerusalemites do have supplemental insurance, we really can't know how many people are actually waiting, you know, 85 days, when their private counterparts are waiting two days. Okay, so I think it's, it's an indication. But the other indication is that except for some fields where the Shari Tzedek gap approaches the Hadassah gap, in other areas, it's much less. 
a, a factor of three, three times longer waiting. Uh, three times, three times, 3.3, five times. Whereas at Hadassah, we were seeing six, seven, 10, 20 times longer. And so the message of the researchers, my colleagues who did this research is, having private practice in the public hospital is bad, but pe some people regulate it better. And apparently in Charit Sedek, it's being regulated better than it is in Hadassah. And so when we talk about is the purchase of supplemental insurance to be used to choose your physician in inequitable, it depends in part on the intervention of the managers and the regulators. OK, now is an eightfold longer wait for public versus private clinic appointment at the same institution discriminatory by law? So. Uh, lawyers didn't want to answer the question from any of the government agencies, but physicians, but, but if well, I asked you that question, I'd probably get 100% would say it's discriminatory. What's amazing to me is that of the doctors, 21% said don't know and 13% said no, which means, yes, if you go by majority, it's discriminatory. But there is a significant portion of physicians who feel, for whatever reason, for instance, the reason might be, you know what, maybe if you wait eight times longer, your problem will go away before you get into the medical system and before they start testing you and before they start infecting you. Okay, I don't know what explains the red and gray in this. If I were asked that question, I would be in the red and gray. Okay, what's the supplemental insurance used for? I think I'll make it. About 40% of it is used to choose the physician uh, in order to, uh, uh, to have an operation. That's mostly in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv where that opportunity is afforded either because in Jerusalem it's legal or in Tel Aviv because there are private hospitals that can supply it. Although interestingly, for one of the sick funds, the highest use of this is in the southern district, not considered one of the uh, richer areas. So um, it's interesting to know why uh, in a poorer geographical area, 30% uh, is used, but no more than 40% of the supplemental insurance is used for that. Apparently, if that option was open across the country, the 40% would probably go up to 80 or 90%. 11% is for dental care and 12% is for, sup for second opinions. Is it good to choose your physician? The only so study that I know of this, in other words, if you go privately and you go shorter and you choose your physician, are you better off health-wise than your public neighbor who doesn't have that opportunity? And it's not a clear picture. In a high percentage of operations, even if you don't choose the top physician, a top physician is there overseeing the procedure. And in many cases, you are buying the services of a private physician to perform procedures that don't require such high level expertise. So there's an efficiency failure here and a market failure in information. And when you ask why do people buy supplemental insurance, we have a high degree of risk aversion in Israel. You can never have enough health coverage. And when people come to me and say, should I buy the supplemental insurance? And I say, I have it, but I don't think you should bother. <laughs> and should I buy private insurance? I say, I don't have it, and I don't think you should have it either. So there's a, there's a, a problem here, and maybe this goes back to the connection between the private sector and government. Um, so what do I suggest in this picture? The first thing I suggest is let's deprivatize the three major areas that cause Israel to only be spending 60% public of its national health expenditure uh, and let's turn it into 70 or 80 like most European countries, all of which almost have supplemental insurance, but they publicly cover dental, mental, and long-term care. If we covered dental, mental, and long-term care, we would be at the OECD, OECD average or above it. So if you want to make the argument, well, while we allow this creeping use of supplemental insurance to 
privatize the system, how can we expect that we'll ever add long-term care, dental care, and medical care? That's an argument I'm willing to hear. But to say that the system has become extremely privatized, no, it has not nationalized parts that were intended to be nationalized that were always private. And what are the policy options for that 10% of the national health insurance law that may be being privatized? So we could ask the government to give more. And after a year of a recent Blue Ribbon Commission, that's what came out. The government gave a billion shekels more to the health system. Uh, we could raise the health tax on the citizens. That's got its pluses and minus. Or we could allow the supplemental insurance, which already exists and would provide up to 3.5 billion shekels if we allowed private practice in public hospitals in Israel, hopefully well regulated, like a Charit Sedek, or even better. Um, but in the last year, the government, due to the opposition to the idea of private practice, the government elected to take a billion shekels for the health system instead of 3.5 billion. Um, and there's creative ways to allow choice of physician. The physician doesn't have to be the one who gets the money. The hospital could get the money and reward the physician based on his performance. And maybe this would lead to more physicians working longer hours in the public sector. Um, so, Rami, since you focused on supplemental insurance, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Supplemental insurance is organized in the form of mutualité. It's not like private commercial insurance, but it's also not like public government revenue. It's in Eleanor Ostrom. It's in the Eleanor Ostrom realm. It reflects the willingness of pay of the, uh, of the population, but also maybe too much risk aversion. The supplemental insurance provides a testing ground for services that it includes to test them out to see if they should be included in the basic basket. So that's almost like free research. But the supplemental insurance is not equitable if it's not universal, and we only have 73 to 80% who have it. And we should pay attention to the fact that if we get rid of the supplemental insurance, we may have to raise the health tax. Or if we allow more use of the supplemental insurance, its premiums may go up, and then we have to have a public discussion. What would we rather do, pay more health tax or pay more supplemental insurance? This is research I did a couple of years ago that shows that in relative priority, funding supplemental insurance for those who don't have it is a high priority for the Israeli public. In another study, priorities on health services by my colleague Deora Kaplan, one of the priorities was subsidizing supplemental insurance for the poor. And just some points about Turkey. Turkey seems less pluralistic to me than what I just des described. Seems like political leadership was dominant to get the health transformation uh, program through. Turkey, in effect, has a single-payer system, while we have four uh, insurance funds. It seemed to me that Turkey had very little private insurance. Um, and this whole setup enables more central control than Israel has. On the other hand, Israel's pluralism, which makes regulation difficult, also allows some innovation from the field. Uh, and our physicians, and it seems like there's a lot of opposition of the, of the Turkish Medical Association against the health transformation program, our physicians, I think, while they're not always happy with our system, they're used to working in the kind of frameworks, bureaucratic health plan and hospital frameworks that we've set up. And so maybe the finance provision uh, and innovation in health care has to be a combination of bottom-up and top-down uh, initiatives. Tesekur ederem vi sizinli baris olabire. That's just between me and the Turks also. <laughs> <laughs>